Hi guys, it's me again, Mrs. Malay, here to continue reading Restart by Gordon Corman. Today's chapter is told from our main character's perspective, Chase's perspective, and it actually starts off, I don't know if you could see this, um, with some italicized writing. And whenever I see that in a book, I know it's generally something that the character is thinking or dreaming or reading or remembering. Sometimes even it's something that they're writing. So um, I know just to pay attention and try to figure out what that italicized writing actually is. And though it's a little confusing at first, as, as we continue reading into the regular text, we can get clues to figure out what that what that italicized writing means and is telling us. Okay, here we go. Chapter 18, Chase Ambrose. It is in the finding of this court that the three juveniles, Chase Matthew Ambrose, Aaron Joshua Hakimian, and Stephen Beresford Bratsky, acted recklessly and with malice, not merely destroying property, but creating chaotic circumstances that could have endangered the public safety. Further, this is not an isolated incident. It is part of a pattern of intimidation and misbehavior toward others. Therefore, it is in this court's decision that the aforementioned juveniles perform community service until such time as their caseworker concludes that this destructive behavior has been corrected. Hi, Chase. When the hand grasps my shoulder, I practically jump out of my skin scaring poor Brendan halfway back to the breakfast line in the cafeteria. My head has been spinning all morning. Dad asked for my birth certificate so he could set up the appointment with Dr. Wynn. I finally found it in mom's desk, but that's not all I found. I also stumbled on a copy of the court paper sentencing Aaron, Bear, and me to community service. So now it's clear what that italicized text was. It was the paper that Chase found in his mom's desk that had um, sentenced the boys to do the community service. What's wrong? Brendan asked in concern. You look like you've just seen the zombie apocalypse and it's coming this way. How can I explain it? It may not be the zombie apocalypse, but it's just as creepy. The judge's words have been burning themselves in my brain. Pattern of intimidation, zero remorse pathway to criminality if I left if left unchecked. I didn't realize how bad it was. Oh sure, the flashbacks keep coming. I remember the wide berth kids gave me when I got back to school after the accident and continue to give me to this day. The general sentiment that Hiawassee Middle School and maybe the whole world would be a better place without me. I'm a pretty heavy presence here. And since I've done nothing in my new life to earn that reputation, it's safe to say that it comes from the secret history amnesia erased from the 13 years before I fell off the roof. Up until a couple of weeks ago, my four-year-old half-sister treated me like a Sasquatch that wandered into her life, an unpredictable and dangerous beast. And her mother, an adult, wasn't much more comfortable around me. Aaron and Bear aren't exactly choir boys, so it's safe to assume I wasn't either. But in spite of the rough way they treat other people, they always have my back. That's loyalty, a good quality, isn't it? I close my eyes and see the empty velvet case from Mr. Solway's closet. Brendan, how bad was I, I blurt. An English muffin rolls off his tray and hits the floor. What are you talking about, he stammers. Leaf man never could have happened if it wasn't for you. I mean, before, I press. The old chase. Who cares, he insists. You were really different then. I know I was different. Different how? Did I ever do anything to you? After a long silence, Brendan runs a finger across his right out eyebrow. When I look close, I realize there's a scar there, partly hidden, about half an inch long. My heart leaps into my throat. I did that? I was leaning over the drinking fountain. You came by and shoved me in the back of the head. Three stitches. Brendan, my voice is husky. I'm so sorry. You know the worst part, he goes on, you just kept walking. You never even bothered to turn around. No follow-up. That's how nothing it was. That's how nothing I was. I can't speak. I think of Aaron and Bear, our loyalty. It kind of doesn't mean as much as I thought it did. Anyway, Brennan tells me, like I said, you're different now. I'll catch you later in video club. I watch him walk away. I don't know what I'm so broken up about. 
I haven't learned anything new today, not really. The stuff in the court document, old news. I smell it in every corner of this school. And even if I needed confirmation, it's right there in Joel Weber's eyes. Fear, real fear. It hits me that no matter how different I am, no matter how much the video club accepts me, or even Shoshana does, I'll never be able to erase the Chase Ambrose who could strike terror in an innocent kid's heart. Aaron Bear and I must have been no strangers to that look when we were turning Joel's life upside down. I guess having the power to torture another person made us feel like big men, especially when we picked somebody smaller and weaker who was into music instead of sports. And believe it or not, right now, I'm more scared of Joel than he ever was of me, because if I see that fear in his face again, I don't know if I could handle it. In spite of all that, Shoshana and I are getting along better every day. She doesn't hold it against me that her brother thinks I'm the devil. Maybe the turning point was when we were in heaven and ice together and she didn't feel the need to dump a giant sundae on my head. The important thing is we're good. She's promoted me to a full co-creator of our video project on Mr. Solway, which is well into the editing phase. It's coming out fantastic. Editing has been tough. Since we have so much great footage, it's practically painful to decide what to cut. We even argue about it, sometimes change each other's minds. It's a real partnership. Although we're done shooting, we still visit Mr. Solway a lot. On the way, Shoshana stops at her house to back up our project on her computer. She's really paranoid that the school network will, cr will crash and we'll lose our edited footage, so she's constantly saving everything on a memory stick. It goes without saying that I'm not allowed into the Weber home. We don't actually talk about it. It's just understood that I wait outside while she runs in to do the data transfer. One afternoon, I'm standing there, hoping Shoshana's mom doesn't glance out the window and turn the sprinklers on me, when I hear music coming from the house. It's piano, and I realize it must be Joel, Hiawassee's musical prodigy. I, obviously, it isn't the first time I've heard him play. Aaron Bear and I were in the auditorium to watch our firecrackers go off. So we must have experienced a, at least a little of his music, but it's my first time in this new life. He's amazing. And not just because he plays fast without making mistakes, the notes flow like a river, speeding up, slowing down, changing in tone and texture. It's almost as if the piano's singing. I wish I knew more about music so I could really appreciate it. I'm crossing the lawn almost without realizing I'm putting one foot in front of the other. I'm following the sound, which seems to be coming from the side window. Before I know it, I'm at the bushes peering inside. There's Joel, seated at a baby grand, lost in his performance. I'm almost overcome with shame. We took this kid's talent and made him a target because of it. When the attack comes, I'm totally caught off guard. A supernova of blonde fur launches it at, itself at me, clamping its paws around my leg and burying its teeth in the denim of my jeans. With a cry of shock, I stagger back, toppling into a large barberry bush. As I go down, my face and arms are ripped to shreds by the stiff wooden branches and tiny thorns. The dog is smart enough to jump off before I hit the bush. It stands at the edge of the flower bed, yapping at me. The music stops and Joel appears in the window. When he spots me lying in the hedge, his eyes open wide in shock. It's not what you think, I blurt, even though the window's closed and he probably can't hear me. To Joel, this must look like his former tormentor is at it again, stalking him in his own home. How could I be so stupid? I try to get out of the hedge, but every time I move, I get scratched and tangled even more. Plus, that agitates the dog, who starts howling. A moment later, Mrs. Weber marches across the lawn, tossing over her shoulder. You must be mistaken, Joel. There's no way Chase Ambrose. She spies me and falls silent. Joel is next. See, I told you, it's him. I try to explain. I'm just waiting for Shoshana. We're going to visit Mr. Solway. And that's a reason to skulk in our bushes, Mrs. Weber demands icily. Technically, I'm doing more bleeding than skulking. But I just say, I heard the music. And then the dog, Mom, Shoshana's voice, what's going on? Shoshana backs up my story, which according to Mrs. Weber is the only reason they're not calling the cops. The two of them drag me out of the hedge, which is even more painful than going in. Good dog, Mitzi, is Joel's comment. I turn to Mrs. Weber. I'm sorry for the disturbance. I came closer to hear the music. And when the dog attacked, I fell in the bushes. I added to Joel, you're really good. 
He didn't, he doesn't answer. His mother looks me over critically. You're bleeding. And then I guess we can't let you walk around like that. She drags me into the kitchen and washes my cuts and scratches with antiseptic. The good news is Mitzi's bite didn't break the skin. The bad news is every thorn and branch did. It's the worst agony I can remember since I fell off the roof, and I can't shake the feeling that Mrs. Weber is loving supplying it. It's the first time I've ever seen Joel smile. Even Shoshana's grinning a little, although she tries to disguise it as sympathy. I don't know what's worse, the pain or the reason they're enjoying watching me suffer. The next time I'm outside the Weber house waiting for Shoshana to back up our work, I keep my distance. Joel's playing the piano again. I hear it, and I can actually see him at the keys through the side window. He glances up, spots me, and gets to, my, gets to his feet. I'm thinking, oh man, I'm in trouble now. He's going to sick the dog on me again, or worse, his mom. Then he does the last thing I ever expected. He reaches over, opens the window, and goes back to his practicing. If I didn't know better, I'd swear he wants me to listen. At school, lunch is turning into the most stressful part of my day. I've been alternating my cafeteria time, one day at the football table with Aaron Bear and the Hurricanes, and the next across the lunchroom with the video club. I take a lot of flack from the team, who can't understand me hanging out with Dork Nation. I realize the players joke around a lot, but it's starting to sound less and less like joking. Even when I'm with the video club, it's awkward because Joel's there. We're not friends, but we both run with the same crowd. Usually I sit at one end of the table and Joel sits on the opposite side. One day though, he comes late and the only seat left is right next to me. At first I think he's going to bolt for the far end of the cafeteria to make a statement that he'd rather eat in another zip code than sit by me. And he does hesitate a little. Eventually though, he gives in and sets his tray next to mine. Everybody else is looking at us like there's supposed to be a major war, but nothing happens. Still a couple days later, the others make sure there's a spot for Joel nice and far from me. None of this escapes the watchful attention of Aaron and Bear. I get that you hang out with the video dweebs now, Aaron tells me, but him, Joel Weber, it's thanks to him that we got put on community service. Yeah, and we never did anything to him, I retort sarcastically. Okay, fine, says Bear, but how were we supposed to know he was going to go crying to mommy? We booby-trapped his piano in an auditorium full of people, I barked, I think his mommy would have noticed without him ratting us out. All right, you made your point, Aaron Seuss. It wasn't the nicest thing to do. And we're paying the price for it, aren't we? It's over, forget it. And why Joel, huh? I go on. I know you think all the kids in the, at this school who don't play football are either dweebs, wimps, or losers. But how is he different from everybody else? Because he's small, because he's talented? Bear explodes. Why don't you ask yourself? You're the one who picked on him. You used to be a fun guy, or did you forget that too? We did what we did because it was fun. And the more Weber lost his mind, the funner it was, especially to you. Did it feel great when we heard he was going to go to another school? No, but by then we were headed to the Graybeard Motel. So who cared where they sent him? I can feel the color draining from my face. That might be the closest I'll ever get to understanding how my brain worked before the accident. I may not like it, but it's me. That afternoon, Shoshana and I finished the final edit on our entry for the contest. We've titled it Warrior. Neither of us can wait to play it for Mr. Solway, but we make the usual stop at the Weber home for Shoshana to back up our work. Like always, I wait on the lawn while Shoshana heads into the house. She pauses in the doorway and tosses a look over her shoulder. Aren't you coming? A million questions whirl through my head. Did I hear her right? Is she kidding? Will her mom kill me? Her brother? Her dog? Yet somehow I know that if I ask any of them, I'll spoil it, and the opportunity will be lost forever. So I follow her into the house. Mrs. Weber sees me first. She stares at me for a second and then goes back to the book she's reading. In the living room, Joel is at the piano as usual. He glances up at me and the music comes to a momentary halt. He takes a long, hard look and then goes back to his con concerto. Con con I can't say the word. Concerto. I'm not sure why but I feel an odd surge of emotion and have to swallow hard a couple of times. Even Mitzi wags her tail. So there we are, guys. That's the end of chapter 18. And we, get, we continue uh, to see Chase finding more out about himself before the accident. And we see 
that internal struggle he has trying to figure out who is he really, that person from before or this new person that he is now, and kind of him trying to come to terms with the fact that he wasn't a very nice guy before. All right, stopping there for today. See you.